Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Jonathan Hazel. Jonathan joins us today to talk about Phillips Curves, R-Stars, and nominal wage rigidity, all the way from the London School of Economics. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, David. You know, I've listened to the show many times. I grew up reading your blog, so it's a real privilege to be here. Well, thank you for uh, reading the blog back in its glory days. I don't do that anymore. And thank you for following the podcast. I've had several of your colleagues on the show, Ricardo Rice, Ethan Elzetsky, and Ben Mole. And you're at a great place, great history of macroeconomics, London School of Economics. We'll talk more about that as we, we get into your career. But a real delight to have you on. You've done some amazing work on Phillips curves, on wage rigidity, a very fascinating new paper on our star, an improvement upon what we probably have already. So I'm excited to chat with you today about all of that. Before we do that, though, let's talk about you. How did you get into macroeconomics? What's your career path? Great. So I guess, I mean, I, I feel really privileged because it's what I wanted from a very young age. My parents, my family always tease me that they remember me reading The Economist magazine as a child. When I was 16 through 18, the financial crisis was unfolding. And I remember watching the events unfolding and thinking, that's it, I want to be an economist. You know, I was reading the blogs, Paul Krugman, yourself, Scott Summon, and many others. And I just thought this is such a vital, such an intellectual, such an important series of debates. People were trying to figure out what was going on, looking at data, using simple theory. I thought this was a conversation I wanted to be a part of. So that's basically it. I was so influenced by these events and by the discussion about these events at the right time of being a teenager that that I went on this path ever since. Economics generally and also macroeconomics specifically, business cycles, finance, monetary economics, that kind of thing. Now, did you come to the U.S. to do your graduate work and then go back to London afterwards? That's right. So I started off as an undergrad at Cambridge in the U.K. And then I was lucky enough to do my PhD at MIT, which is a great program. And then coming, I guess, back to my origin story. I vividly remember reading a couple of Paul Krugman blog posts and also an essay by Ken Rogoff, where they spoke about their experiences being PhD students at MIT back in the 1970s. I remember thinking this is such a sort of gilded experience and thinking one day with my fingers crossed that it could be me. And indeed it was. And so it was a real dream dream come true to come to MIT. And then also afterwards to manage to land this job, which which has the colleagues, the environment that, that I could dream for. Yeah, I can imagine the hallway conversations at the London School of Economics must be something else. Just be able to walk down the hall and say, hey, Ricardo, what do you think about this or this? It's an absolute gift. One thing that is remarkable, well, maybe two things that are remarkable about LSE. The first is that we have an amazing age distribution. So I have some of the best young colleagues of my age working on all these diverse topics, on markups, on international finance, and so on. And then I have colleagues going all the way up through Ricardo Rice, Ben Moore, Ethan Ilzetsky, Silvana Tenreiro, some of whom you've had on your podcast, all the way up through to a Nobel Prize winner like Chris Pissarides. And at any point in time, I can hail any of these people down to have lunch. So for me, it just feels like a real privilege to be able to have these conversations. And you have a very big department, too. I was looking online, a lot yeah. of an economist, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. And so there's, I, I suppose the other thing that I, I think is really remarkable about the department is I think throughout my colleagues there, I think there's a real commitment to trying to ask really big picture, interesting questions. And you'll see that from your podcast guests too. You know, when you interview Ricardo, when you interview Ethan, or when you interview Ben, I think you're never short of a sense, I guess, that these are the people asking the really important questions that, you know, why is inflation going up? What's going to happen to interest rates? The ones that are the core of macro, and I really appreciate the sense that we're always trying to be doing rigorous research, but also part of that vital, important conversation. Well, absolutely. And again, just to reiterate the rich history of the London School of Economics, just a few names from the past. John Hicks, famous person of the ISLM, Bill Phillips of the Phillips Curve, James Mead, I'm a fan of him because he was an early nominal GDP targeter. Lionel Robbins, I guess back in the 30s, helped really establish it. William Beveridge of the Beveridge Curve, very amazing. Of course, in F.A. Hayek in the 70s and other names as well. So a rich history. You walk down those hallways and, you know, their presence is there with you. And you're just thinking, man, I got these great minds now in the past. So fun place to be. And you get to teach macroeconomics there. So Tell us about that. Are you teaching graduate or undergraduate or both? 
So I teach both. I teach first year undergrads, third year undergrads, and second year PhDs. One thing that's nice about that is I teach, I guess, the very first, the very last course that you could take as a macroeconomist. It's the first course that undergrads uh, take. It's called Equon B1, Introductory Macroeconomics, and the last course, which is called something like Research Methods. And I, I really like that because I, I suppose it keeps you honest. On the one hand, to the PhD students, you're teaching things at the frontier. You don't need to persuade them that it's important. They're interested in the Phillips curve. They're interested in inflation. They're interested in unemployment. They're interested in the cutting edge. And that's relatively easy to explain. But of course, you know, as academics, we often get trapped in our own little bubbles. And it's very easy to persuade other academics inside this bubble that that's important. For me, it's a tremendous source of discipline. But then I, I go back and I teach first year undergrads who, frankly, I have to work really hard to persuade that anything I understand is valuable. And that's so important because it would be easy, I think, for any of us, for any academic to get trapped in sidelines in, in research that doesn't really matter. But when a student asks you, why should I care about this? You need to have a ready answer and you need to talk about things like the Great Depression, the current burst of inflation, the financial crisis. And you really need to be anchored to that kind of thing. So I love teaching first year undergrads. Completely different challenge. That's great. Now, at the graduate level, what are grad students learning? What is the cutting edge? Are they learning like uh, Hank models now? What's What would be in their curriculum? Right. right, right. I take a particular view on what I want them to learn from me. Because there are many branches in modern macroeconomics. So Hank models, heterogeneous agent, New Keynesian models, obviously very big. My colleagues, Ben and Ricardo, have been seminal in, in, in founding that class of models. Not my comparative advantage. I'm not a genius coder or a mathematician. The stuff that gets me really excited is empirical work. And I like to think about maybe three classes of empirical work. The first is maybe what I'll call old-fashioned time series econometrics, looking at the aggregate plots of unemployment, inflation, interest rates, and so on. I think that's never the, the last word, but I think it's very important to have that often be the first word because you want to be familiar with what's going on with inflation today, unemployment today, the aggregate patterns that we really need to sort of understand well. So I like to do some of that. The second thing, I like to go to the microdata and talk about causal identification. I was very influenced by this famous paper by one of my PhD advisors, this guy called Jonathan Parker, who was able to estimate the marginal propensity to consume. So he was able to estimate how much of a sort of windfall of cash uh, consumers are likely to spend. He was able to estimate that using this, this amazing natural experiment when the federal government sort of at different random times gave money to different consumers in 2009. So I'm very influenced by sort of going to the microdata and using these clever natural experiments to figure out what's happening to consumer spending. And then the third plank of what I try to teach the students is something in between. So regional empirical macroeconomic approaches. And there's a lot you can learn from the region that I think has advantages versus the aggregate or versus the microdata. Because in regional information, you can sort of hold fixed certain things like the stance of aggregate monetary policy, but you can also maybe get a better understanding of mechanisms than you would in the microdata alone. So that I'm really influenced by, for instance, the landmark work that my co-author Artif Mian did now about 10 years ago, trying to understand the sources of the Great Recession. And he showed there that regional variation in, in house price booms and busts seem to be really important. And that's the kind of thing that I think students need to know and that where the regional approach is really helpful. So those are the three things, you know, empirical work, but with aggregate time series, regional stuff, and then also microdata. Okay, and we'll come to a paper of yours shortly where you use those very skills, the one on Phillips curves. But before we leave graduate macro and undergraduate macro education, what would be your advice to young students who are aspiring to become the next Jonathan Hazel? <laughs> David, as you know, you've had this question with me before, and I thought very hard about it. I think it's difficult. And in the end, I came up with three observations. The first is that I think what we do, what you and I do, what academics do, it's an extremely difficult path. It's very lonely. It's it's very difficult. One needs a lot of faith in one's own research abilities, even if that faith might be misplaced. On the other hand, it has tremendous rewards. So my first piece of advice is that I think one really has to make sure that you absolutely love the research for its own sake, because it's a very hard path with the tremendous rewards of doing what you love. But if you don't love it, then it won't be worth it. And so kind of coming to one of your earlier questions from a young age, I really was sort of quite besotted with this subject. And so in the end, it was an easy choice for me. But I think understanding that you really love it is a sort of prerequisite to it being the right choice. 
The second is that if you do really feel like you have a passion for it, I think it's important to pursue it relentlessly. For me, in my 20s and even now, trying to do a PhD entailed lots of sacrifices. I, I remember when I was an undergrad, I was known amongst my friends and my broader peer group as someone who was not partying very hard, not going out very much, because I studied extremely hard. And, and that was what it took and what it still takes even more now than before to, to go to a top PhD program, which is an important part of trying to become an economist. But my third point, and this is, I think, the most important is that if you really enjoy macroeconomics, I think it's important to recognize that there are many different ways to exercise that passion because people are very different. I'll give one example, one personal hero of mine has been for all of my adult life, Tyler Cowen, who uh, blogs of Marginal Revolution as a colleague of yours. And I'm not sure he would call himself a macroeconomist, but perhaps he is to some extent. And one thing that's remarkable about him is he's obviously forged a completely unique path to figuring out what it is that's going to make him a great intellectual. And I think it's important for everyone to figure out what that is. For me, for instance, for me, I'm pretty well suited to doing a PhD, but I think many people aren't. And there are many other ways to exercise being a great macroeconomist, finance, central banking, public intellectuals. And so I think my third piece of advice I'll give to a young aspiring macroeconomist is to figure out what is exactly the way that you think you're best fit into that. Because it might not be a PhD, it might be something else. That's great advice. And I should say Tyler Calwin is my colleague and my boss. He, he leads the Mercatus Center and we had him on recently and he had fun talking macro with me. We, we went back and evaluated what macro theories did well over the past few years. So he enjoys it, but he is, he's definitely widely read a unique path. And I'm thankful for the fact that he brought me on at Mercatus too. So great points. And your last point, I think, is especially important. It's comparative advantage. It's what we teach in Econ 101, that you, you may not be, you know, Paul Krugman, but you can be somebody else and you have some value added to offer. So there's always opportunity for passionate people like you've, you've outlined. Absolutely. I mean, one of the one of the ironies is that even Paul Krugman ended up not being Paul Krugman. So we know him as a academics as this brilliant sort of savant trait theorist. But in the end, he at least decided that an even better fit for him was not being a, a brilliant but nerdy trade theorist and instead expounding macroeconomics and then politics to, to a wide audience. So I, th I think figuring out what it is for you is absolutely essential. And I guess that's part of the fun. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to your work. And you alluded to this paper implicitly a few minutes ago, because it requires a lot of, of micro data, regional data. And it's a very influential paper that you helped co-author in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, and it's titled Slope of the Phillips Curve, Evidence from U.S. States. And I think it's also fitting that you were a part of this because you're at the London School of Economics. And as your colleague Ricardo Rice reminded me, Bill Phillips was there. So Phillips Curve has a rich history, the very building where you work. So very fascinating paper, shook up many priors of people. How steep is the Phillips Curve? How do we interpret Paul Volcker's disinflation? So you, you kind of kind of shook things up there, Jonathan. And I just want to start before we get into what you found, what you guys did, and most of our listeners will know this, but let's just start very basic. What is a Phillips curve? You say most of our listeners will not know this, but of course, there's a lot of confusion. Even with me and my co-authors, as we think about this, about, about what exactly the Phillips curve is or how we should define it. And as you said, so my Ricardo was probably too humble to mention that he is, in fact, the A.W. Phillips Professor of Economics. So, so indeed, Phillips is central to, to what we do here at the LSE. The Phillips curve, I think, probably properly stated, the quote-unquote new Keynesian Phillips curve, says mathematically that current inflation can be caused by three factors. The first is changes in slack, changes in what's sometimes called a forcing variable. Typically, this will be measured by something like unemployment, something like output gap. And so the idea here is that when the economy is booming, when unemployment is very low, when output is very high relative to trend, when labor markets are very tight, then inflation is going to rise. So that would be the first thing, the first way in which inflation can be caused. The second is supply shocks. If there's a supply shock, like a surge in oil prices, maybe a bottleneck, maybe some kind of issue in reallocating labor to where it needs to go, that's the kind of thing that could also perhaps bid up wages and therefore bid up prices. The third factor could be inflation expectations. Inflation might be high today because people expect inflation is going to be very high in the future. So this is this landmark idea going back to Milton Friedman that says, well, if we knew that 
inflation was going to be very high in the future, perhaps because a central bank had set the inflation target very high, perhaps because there was lots of money in printing, that kind of thing, then people today would bake that into their expectations and therefore demand higher prices today, meaning inflation's high today. So that's it in its basic form. Inflation, uh, the Phillips curve or the New Keynesian Phillips curve is a sort of structural relationship between, on the one hand, inflation as an outcome variable, and on the other hand, inflation expectations, slack as often proxied by unemployment and supply shocks. So I think of that as the basics. Pro- probably you agree, maybe not. Oh, yeah, yeah, completely, I, completely. Yeah, I mean, a closely related thing that people often talk about loosely as the Phillips curve is something like the correlation between inflation and unemployment. And you can see how those that could be similar to what I'm calling the quote-unquote New Keynesian Phillips curve, but it might not be the same or it might be a little bit different. And indeed, a lot of what people try and figure out is how this correlation between inflation and unemployment is related to the to the structural New Keynesian Phillips curve. Yeah, I, I think people often will criticize that latter definition, which is just a simply reduced form correlation between slack and inflation, which is a good rule of thumb to maybe start with, right? It's, it's a good way to, to think things through. But what you outlined, the original definition is a structural model. I like to think of it as a form of short-run aggregate supply, going back to Econ 101. It's, it's kind of an inverted short-run aggregate supply curve. And it, I think it's very intuitive. I mean, if there's slack or if the economy is overheating, you think that would have some relationship to inflation. If people think you know the central bank's credible and they've grounded inflation expectations, and finally, unexpected supply shocks. So all those things make a lot of sense. And if you can imagine, listeners, you have this equation. So you've got inflation on the left-hand side equal to these three terms. And the thing that's really fascinating in this paper that you guys look at is you really take to task the view of how important that output gap or slack term is. So there's a little parameter in front of it, which measures the slope of the Phillips curve. And again, the conventional view of the early 1980s, what Volcker did was he had to enact really high unemployment to get inflation down. Now, you guys really give that a beating. You you really push back on that. I want to mention something in your article that that should have given us pause already. You mentioned some really fascinating work by Thomas Sargent, 1982, The End of Four Big Inflations. And he looked at hyperinflation in Austria, Hungary, Germany, and Poland in the early mid-1920s. And and he shows how those things suddenly dropped. And they were too big, too quick to be explained by slack or unemployment. And and that there, it was kind of a clue, I I think, all along should have stressed the importance of this. So walk us through that journey and, and what you guys uncovered and how did you uncover it? Absolutely. And yeah, so I, I guess, and I should say, the thing that's always top of my mind, of course, as, as should be top of yours and many of your listeners, is that inflation is very high today. So I guess the way I'd like to tell the story of this paper is, is first to not mention high inflation of today and think about this as a story of maybe 1978 to 2020. That's a story of the Volcker recession and what happened afterwards in the Great Recession and so on. Tell that story, which I think our paper did a pretty good job of explaining, and then say, okay, well, what about now? Can we take what we learned in pre-2020 data and then talk about high inflation since? Because obviously, you know, that's the key question at the moment. So let me go back and sort of tell the story of this paper first. One moment on, on how it came about. I have three fantastic co-authors for this paper. I mean, Akimura, John Steinton, and Juan Arenio. I was absolutely blessed that when I was in my first year of my PhD, so now a long time ago, I mean, Akimura and John Steinson, these two sort of young guns who were reforming macroeconomics and making it much more empirical, happened to be visiting MIT and were guest lecturing my introductory macroeconomics course as a PhD student. And I was very taken by this very empirical approach that they were working on. And so I offered to become their research assistant, and it ended up becoming this project, which is I think recognizably very similar to a lot of the empirical work that Amy and John do, but then is also what has become, I think, the kind of work that I like to do as well. So that was very fortunate, as was finding our fourth call of Juan, who was another student of Amy and John's. Okay, so that's the discovery, but then let me tell you about the paper. So we're interested in this object, the Phillips curve. And then exactly as you said, David, the episode in US economic history and really around the world that really influenced how we think about the slope of the Phillips curve is the Volcker disinflation. So in the early 1980s, inflation was very high, 
Paul Volcker sharply tightened monetary policy. Unemployment rose sharply. There was this big recession. Inflation fell sharply. So one conventional interpretation of this is that there's a relatively steep Phillips curve. That is to say, when unemployment rises by a lot, then inflation falls by a lot. So that's a decent way to understand the Volcker disinflation potentially. However, if true, then the behavior of inflation after 1985 in the United States and again around the world sort of seemed rather puzzling, which was that during the 1990s in the sort of 20 teens, unemployment became very low, but inflation did not take off. Likewise, during the Great Recession, unemployment became very high. So it was almost 10 percentage points in the United States and inflation did not fall by very much. So from the standpoint that the Phillips curve is slope is steep, from the standpoint of this Volcker experience, the subsequent behavior, this quote unquote missing disinflation or missing reinflation seemed quite puzzling. And this was, you know, in the 2010s, this is, I think, one of the major puzzles that we had. And it was a major debate. So our first observation was to, to try and revive an alternative interpretation of the facts that I told you, the, the facts of the Volcker and then the, the missing movements of inflation that came afterwards with a classic idea that actually went back to Ben Bernanke, but of course, much earlier which was what he called the anchored inflation expectations hypothesis. So his idea was to switch gears and focus on that other force that we said was really important, which was how inflation expectations affected inflation. His observation as kind of applied to modern events would say, look, during the Volcker period, long-run inflation expectations fell very rapidly, perhaps because Volcker was saying, look, I'm a really serious, tough inflation fighter. I'm really going to lower inflation come what may. Subsequently, after 1985 or so, the Fed gets credibility Inflation expectations are very stable, and so inflation doesn't very move very much. So in the first half before 85, you have big movements of inflation because there's lots of movements in inflation expectations due to the fact that the Fed is still sort of finding its feet and bringing things down. And afterwards, inflation is stable because expectations are stable. Now, if that were the story, then, you know, things would sort of make sense again. You could have a flat Phillips curve throughout and inflation expectations really mattering. You mentioned this amazing paper by Sargent in 1982, and he was arguing basically that this should be the case on the basis of these very extreme hyperinflationary episodes where countries like Austria and Germany in the midst of the, the interwar period were able to lower inflation very rapidly without changes in unemployment by really changing how central banks operated to make inflation expectations fall really rapidly. So we were interested in pursuing this idea that the Phillips curve was flat and that inflation expectations were very anchored. And the way that we chose to try and argue this is to use regional data. Why might regional data be very useful? The main reason why we thought regional data could be really helpful is that the inflation regime that I talked about, the long run inflation expectations that could be moving around a lot, this is something that's very hard to deal with. You know, you go to aggregate data, you look at time series of inflation and inflation expectations. It's going to be very hard to disentangle what's causing what, what's driving what. During the Volcker disinflation, you've got all of these oil price shocks, you've got rising unemployment, you've got falling long-run inflation expectations in the inflation regime. Very difficult to separate these things. But in regional data, things are actually quite a lot more simple, we thought. The reason for that is in regional data, every single state has the same central bank, has the same quote-unquote inflation regime. You know, Paul Volcker was setting the aggregate inflation target for all 50 states. That meant... We thought that if you compare two different states, you know, they've got the same long run inflation target. In some sense, you can sort of control for the effects of this long run inflation target. If I take New York and I compare it to Massachusetts or Texas and I can compare it to Florida, Texas and Florida both have the same Paul Volcker. They've both got the same sort of fact that long run inflation expectations are probably changing in the 1980s because the inflation regime is changing. And so I can sort of cancel that out and focus on other sources of variation. In particular, maybe now I can revisit this slope question. So I can ask, look, if unemployment is very high in Florida relative to Texas, or very low in, in Florida relative to Texas, by how much does inflation change? And that would sort of answer this slack question. If slack is much higher in Texas than Florida, by how much does inflation change in Texas versus Florida? That would answer this question of whether or not the Phillips curve is fat or not. So that was really what we decided to do. So, so again, to, to kind of gather where we are, we were saying, look, the sources of inflation on the one hand could be inflation expectations. On the other hand, it could be this slack term. If we look at regional data, we can just kind of eliminate or cancel out the inflation expectations term and focus only on the slack term. Very clever. So that was, 
the insight that we thought was useful. Yeah, um, very clever identification issue because that's always the issue in macro. How do you identify right, right. exogenous variation? So a couple of questions before we get to the rest of the paper. One, did you have this intuition beforehand that inflation expectations were important? That's my first question. And then secondly, how did you construct the state data? That, that's another interesting question. Great, great, great. Absolutely. Okay, so take these questions one by one. How do we realize inflation expectations were important? Here, I, bearing in mind, I, as this project started, I was, a, you know, I was a graduate student in my early 20s. I really learned from my cultures. And one of the things that they were amazing at was really assembling the sort of consensus wisdom from the profession. And having a sense of what people thought and therefore what we needed to understand to really change minds. So the concrete example here was as we were starting to figure out, well, can a flat Phillips curve explain the data? We thought, okay, this seems pretty plausible. And then my co-authors, I remember Emmy Nakamura sort of went around and asked a few people who she thought were very savvy and sort of really understood the data and really understood the time series data well. And in particular, I remember this clearly, she sort of came back to all of us and said, well, I have this great chat with this eminent economist who's called Martin Eichenbaum, who's at Northwestern. And he said, well, I don't really believe your flat Phillips curve story because of Volcker. And we realized that Volcker was the key episode that we really needed to understand if we thought that the Phillips curve was flat. And at some point, sort of a while later, after he moved slowly, we were kind of turning this around, and I was actually the one who remembered this Bernanke speech, this so-called anchored expectations hypothesis. So, you know, everything's there somewhere. And then the, the magic that was absolutely my co-authors and not me was sort of realizing that you could weave together the exciting rhetoric of these different economists with this sort of cutting edge econometric technique. But I can't take credit for that at all. Then the second thing, the data. So this was also fascinating. It, it would be really surprising to many people to realize, to learn that the United States does not have regional inflation measures. The United States, that it has, you can see aggregate inflation, you can go onto Fred very easily and find it, but you can't really see regional inflation. There are some sort of, I think, slightly problematic measures at the city level for a handful of large cities, and some sort of lower frequency, kind of annual or, or decadal measures at the state level. But what we have in mind when we think about inflation, which is a sort of quarterly measure, of how much prices are changing does not exist separately for every state. And so one of the major contributions of this project was simply to construct that. So again, I can't take credit. My magnificent co-author, Juan Jareño, who's now at uh, UC San Diego, spent uh, literally years in the basement of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, painstakingly constructing these state-level price indices. And, and of course, there's so many steps there, because if you imagine how do we construct aggregate inflation? We have millions or perhaps tens, even hundreds of millions of individual price quotes, which are collectively aggregated into aggregate inflation. So now imagine doing that, but now imagine doing it for every state. Now imagine doing that, but doing it in a windowless basement in Washington, D.C., using cobbled together programs that was written by BLS research 20 years prior. So Juan is an amazing programmer, an amazing data scientist, I guess. And so he was able to do that. And in the end, the sort of the inflation indices work pretty well. And we're trying to kind of work with the Bureau of Labor Statistics to make them continuously updated so researchers can use them through to now. So I, I suppose then another thing that, you know, I was really impressed to see to come together is on the one hand, with this project, there are all these high conceptual level ideas about the time series, about expectations, about Slack. And on the other hand, there's this nitty gritty data assembly. And being able to unite both of those was something that was a really remarkable achievement. Again, not really mine. And I think it's something that I admire about my goal is that they're able to, I guess, unite the high and the low, the conceptual big picture stuff and economics that we often discuss, but then also the details of assembling all of these price quotes. Okay, so you had the intuition based on previous research, Bernanke's inflation expectations story. You also... Did the data, hard work, kudos to your co-author. Sounds like a miserable experience, but he did it. And so he put it all together. What did you find? What did we find? So we found, so let me, let me say it as a top line finding and then unfold how we found it. We discovered that the Phillips curve, accounting for inflation expectations, the Phillips curve is flat and has been flat going back to the 1980s, going back to this Volcker period. So, so how do we find that? So this is a surprising finding. How do we find that? In the end, it was quite simple. So first, we looked in the aggregate data about the co-movement between unemployment and inflation. 
very strong code movement. Like I said, that's because of the Volcker period, but that code movement was declining a lot over time. This is what we knew from the aggregate data. But in the cross-sectional data, after you control for inflation expectation, which I, like I said, is like much more tractable to do in the cross-sectional regional data, the relationship between inflation and unemployment is quite weak and quite stable over time. So that stability over time is very supportive of what I said about anchored inflation expectations and so on. Because in the cross-sectional data, once we've held fixed all these issues about inflation expectations moving around, we find a very stable relationship. So that suggests that all of this aggregate volatility and inflation expectations is driven by this big aggregate factor, things like the inflation regime, which is held fixed in the cross-section. So, so that's the first thing. And then how do we arrive at the flatness? Well, if after holding fixed inflation expectations, unemployment co-moves relatively weakly with inflation, then that means in some sense the Phillips curve slope is flat. So in the sense that when unemployment falls by a lot, inflation doesn't rise by very much. So that was the key finding that from the regional data, the Phillips curve slope was flat because after you accounted for inflation expectations, unemployment and inflation co-moved relatively weakly. Now, one thing I do want to say, and this is sort of anticipating where I, I imagine our conversation will go, what we estimated was that the slope of the Phillips curve was flat, but definitely positive. So what I mean by that is when unemployment falls, inflation does rise in the regional data. It doesn't rise by very much, but it does rise. So supply curves, as we estimated them, still slope upwards to give your intuition from the start data. They're just relatively flat supply curves. I suppose the final part of the paper is then we took this number that we'd estimated from the regional data, and we found that it did a pretty good job of explaining the aggregate data too. So of explaining all of this relatively sort of tranquil, moderate movement, between co-movement between inflation and unemployment after 1985. So if you ask many macroeconomists, how do you know if monetary policy matters? They would used to say, well, Friedman and Schwartz in their book, and then Volcker. Those two episodes there show us that monetary policy matters. And it sounds like what you guys have found is you, you still validate that point, but for different reasons when it comes to Volcker's. It was still the Fed, but it was the Fed creating credible inflation expectations as opposed to using the unemployment to, to create the low inflation. Right. That's exactly right. And, and I, I mean... I should say that the, the question that always keeps me up at night as a good empirical monetary economist is how do we know that the money affects uh, inflation in the economy? And it's still so difficult to gather high quality evidence about this, but you're exactly spot on, David. So what, what we find is that monetary policy has tremendous power to affect inflation, but to a large extent, it really seems to be through this expectations channel, as opposed to the direct effect of low unemployment causing high inflation. That said, I mean, if it takes very big changes in unemployment to increase inflation, that's still sort of very much consistent with a world in which monetary policy can have very large effects. Because, you know, if you're a central bank, potentially you can sustain quite large falls in unemployment before inflation starts to rise by too much. So I think a flat Phillips curve is something that would still be consistent with a pretty sort of quote unquote Keynesian view of the world or even a monetary sure. view of the world. But it does suggest that the forward-looking inflation expectations is key. Well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the story I believe you're telling in the paper is that Paul Volcker fighting seriously against inflation and the, and the, and Alan Greenspan Fed that followed him. That's really the important story here. So if you were to construct this data set that you have, and let's say go back to the 1960s, you know. And, and given that we don't think monetary policy was as credible back then, do you think or suspect the slope of the curve might be larger or would it still be inflation expectations that are the key? It's a great question. We'd love to know the answer to that. We looked at this a bit and we felt in the aggregate time series data, which is all we had access to because time state level data doesn't exist for this period, the aggregate time series data is quite consistent with inflation expectations being very important. I think for a podcast, I think it's probably easier to tell a narrative story of inflation expectations on the way up. So the, cl the classic story in which inflation expectations are a very important determinant of rising inflation during the 60s and 70s goes something like the following. During the 60s, there's a big expansion 
in uh, government spending because of the Great Society, because of the Vietnam War. So this is Johnson and JFK. Big expansion in government debt. Strong pressure to keep interest rates low, nevertheless. So large expansion in, in aggregate demand. And this is something that continues to the 1970s, including extra political pressure on the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates low despite rising inflation. So the classic example that people cite is when Nixon pressured Burns in the mid-1970s to keep interest rates low despite rising inflation. And all of this was the kind of thing that led actual inflation to rise, in part because people expected that the Federal Reserve would tolerate very high inflation. So I think this is the classic narrative. Uh, I don't have much to add other than to say that seems to, to have a great degree of truth to me and seems to explain um, inflation pretty well. And that sort of story that goes all the way back to Milton Friedman. The one challenge that we encountered is in a way that seems ridiculous almost to me as, as a modern observer is that large periods of the 1970s had price controls. And so a lot of the behavior of inflation is pretty strange in the 1970s because price controls interfere with inflation a lot because price controls do seem to really work in the sense that when it's illegal to raise prices, prices don't rise by very much. Of course, they have all these bad side effects. And when they're removed, inflation tends to rebound. So inflation behaves quite strange over the early part of the 1970s, probably because of price controls, but it's a little hard to say. Interesting. So both the lack of data and the, if even if you had the data, it would be clouded by this these price controls. Very interesting. One last question about Phillips Curve. We'll move on to your other work. So as you know, in this recent conversation about the inflation surge, and now we have this disinflation happening, there's been several points made, and, and maybe you can respond. And one is, you know, the Fed's credibility was important to the disinflation coming down. That's one point. The other point is that some are invoking a nonlinear Phillips curve. So they would say, yes, we agree with Jonathan about, you know, the, the flat curve, but that's because it's nonlinear. It's flat to a point and pop, it goes up. And so, you know, Gotti Ergenson has a paper he just completed. And I, I would mention one other paper because I had him on the show, Joe Gagnon, Kristen Forbes, and Chris Collins had a paper similarly arguing that there's nonlinear Phillips curves around the world. So maybe speak to the recent experience and the role you think inflation expectations played in, and to what extent can we infer a nonlinear Phillips curve? Great. So I, I've been thinking a lot about this, but I should say that my thoughts are very much in progress. Any of it could be revised. I think that the the nonlinear Phillips curve is plausible, but I, I think a flat Phillips curve story is still plausible. So let me try and um, unfold and explain why. The first point to make is that during the most recent period, long-term inflation expectations did not rise by very much. So during this earlier period, like the Volcker period and so on, long-term inflation expectations are changing a lot. That seems consistent with the Federal Reserve allowing the monetary regime to change some sort of quote-unquote unanchoring of inflation expectations. That absolutely did not happen this time around. So it doesn't seem like inflation expectations were very unanchored. And of course, from the standpoint of our paper, at least the headline of our paper, the behavior of inflation during the current period seems to be a little bit puzzling because inflation expectations didn't move very much, at least long-term inflation expectations, yet inflation rose very quickly. One natural response to that, so this is sort of my second point, is to say maybe the Phillips curve is nonlinear, which is to say that in the range of data that one observes between 1978 and 2020, inflation tends to budge relatively little when unemployment falls. But perhaps when unemployment gets, gets extremely low, like we saw in the recent period, or other measures of labor market slack get extremely tight, like we saw in the re recent period, perhaps then suddenly inflation takes off. This is the idea of the nonlinear Phillips curve. And it, it clearly has some sort of intuitive truth to it, which is that if every single worker is employed and you, David, are the final unemployed worker left and every firm wants to hire you, well, well, one thinks probably you could have a pretty good shot to bid up your wage as much as you want. And then maybe that wage would pass through into rising prices. So the nonlinear Phillips curve story is sort of that's the argument that we have in mind. So Gatti and Pier Paolo and others have sort of made the case that it's there in the data, which I think is a, is a very reasonable case. One difficult thing about the nonlinear Phillips curve and any story that confronts the time series data is that so many things are going on in the time series. At the same time as you have the nonlinearity that they sort of wish to detect of a tight labor market and rising inflation, many other things are happening too. For instance, many supply shocks to oil, to labor market frictions, the bottlenecks and so on. So, you know, I think there could well be some truth to the nonlinear Phillips curve story. 
I'm not willing to, to give up on the flat Phillips curve story just yet. I'm still sort of curious about investigating it. And that's for the following reason. Between the end of 2020 and roughly now, the United States underwent a gigantic and very persistent demand drop. Even with a flat Phillips curve, one might expect that very big demand drop to have large effects on inflation. And I think just to not lose sight of this big demand drop, I think it's helpful to put some numbers on it. If you take the fiscal stimulus of the last quarter of December 2020 and the first quarter in, in March 2021, there was fiscal stimulus around 13% of US GDP. The CARES Act, which was in March 2020, added in fiscal stimulus of another 7%-ish of GDP, I think. I, you know, I might be getting the exact numbers wrong. But if you take the fiscal stimulus of 2020 and 2021, you're looking at a fiscal stimulus of something in excess of 20% of GDP. So this is extraordinary. You know, this is unprecedented in peacetime. So start with that and then apply a multiplier to it. So imagine that the Federal Reserve, at least initially, doesn't respond by raising interest rates, which seems to be what happened in the data. So maybe you start to apply a multiplier like 1.5 or 2 to that. So now you're ending up with really, truly staggering numbers, like a total fiscal demand impulse of something like 30 to 40% of GDP, just bonkers numbers. Even with the flat Phillips curve that we estimated, you'd expect a very large response to inflation. So I suppose that's why I, for one, I'm still curious about the flat Phillips curve, because I think it's easy to lose sight of just how big the demand drop was. Back in 2021, people like Blanchard and Summers were saying inflation is really going to take off. By and large, they weren't invoking nonlinearities. They were just saying, look, fiscal stimulus is so big. Fiscal stimulus is so big that the response of inflation might be a bit too. Again, I might be wrong on the precise numbers, but I think it's sort of a hypothesis worth investigating that what was really going on was just a very big demand trap. Now, one, one challenge with the story of a flat Phillips curve and a big demand trap is the behavior of unemployment. So unemployment in the United States is roughly 3%. It was also roughly 3% in 2019. But of course, in 2019, inflation was not very high. And so I think if we're going to go down the big demand truck story, we do need some explanation for why unemployment wasn't incredibly low, because that's sort of what you would need for this story to work. But, you know, one can think of reasons why perhaps unemployment had reached its rock bottom. And, you know, slack was showing up elsewhere in the labor market, for instance, by workers doing lots of job to job switching. So I guess I guess to summarize, to come back to your original question, you know, I think it's quite possible that the nonlinear Phillips curve could be what's going on. I think it's equally possible that you have a big demand shock along a flat slope. I think also supply shocks will have played some role. I'm not sure how much. And so I would say the jury's still out. I think one thing I learned from this process is just this is how difficult macroeconomics is. That here we are after the fact with you know all of our, our phds and our learning and we're still really struggling and you know it gives me uh, a deep sense of sympathy for for instance the current fed because i might say look the fed was very behind the curve in 2021 but you and i are only just now perhaps catching up with the curve in 2024 i, I guess that's my, my my view that it's difficult to know for sure and it could be non-linearity but not sure just yet that is so fascinating i hadn't thought of that before but yeah, that that is definitely a possibility, right? Given the huge size of fiscal stimulus and support for monetary policy, you could have a real small parameter, real small you know number on that slope parameter, and still have you know sizable inflation. I mean, you know, if you look at core inflation, six percent. I mean, if you look at headline, which is you know oil, t- take that out. Yeah, that totally maps on. It could be a plausible interpretation of what sure, happened. Sure. I mean, a, a different way to put it is, if I say to you, there's a fiscal stimulus of twenty percent. Of GDP, literally of twenty percent of GDP, and I give you a multiplier that's greater than one. Aren't you a bit surprised that inflation <laughs> only rose to six percent? Because it's you know, it's, yeah. I, at the time, I have some sympathy for the Biden administration because at the time they thought, look, the the worst mistake is to let a lingering recession carry on, and they absolutely didn't let that happen. But perhaps they made a mistake in the other direction. Yes, and again, you can I think weave the story where both inflation expectations maybe muted some of the otherwise big impact on inflation from the stimulus, and then also that Phillips curve slope play, played a role as well. Yeah, so fascinating. I like to always bring out as a data point, Jonathan. As you know, I'm a big fan of nominal GDP targeting, and even though we don't do it, but implicitly you can use it kind of as a rule of thumb. If you look at the pre-pandemic trend path of nominal GDP. 
compared to where it is today. It's about $2 trillion larger or above that path. That had to come from somewhere. That didn't miraculously appear. That's a policy choice. And I think we could argue maybe that was necessary. Maybe that was worth the trade-off. But the point is, where, you know, where did it come from? How did it get there? The thing that I was surprised from now, the 15 years that I've spent being a macroeconomist, is I, I thought in 2020, as perhaps you did, that the real danger was a sort of 2010 to 2015 style. Oh, yes. Grindingly high unemployment. And that, of course, didn't happen. Uh, the opposite happened, which was an absolutely booming economy at the cost of high inflation. What I've been very surprised by is how much less popular the current economy is than the economy of 2010 to 2015 in the United States. I would have thought that the current economy would be fantastic and everyone would be relatively happy despite the high inflation. I would have thought that all of the problems that people were complaining about for the last 12 years, low interest rates, high unemployment, had been completely solved. And that wasn't the case. So one place where I really changed my prize was on how much people dislike inflation versus unemployment, and therefore on the value of absolutely giant fiscal stimulus. So I found that very surprising. No, likewise, I found it very fascinating that in polls, you suddenly see the number one concern being this high inflation. In fact, there's an Ipsos poll that tracks it around the world. And for a long time, you see inflation being more important than COVID, than racial issues, all these other things you think are important. There was There's a study also done, I forget who did it, but they looked at Google searches for inflation, and they, they found this threshold effect that when people don't really look for inflation until it got around 3 to 4%, and suddenly, boom, there's this increase. So there, there's some point at which people really become cognizant and, and worry about it. So that, that's a great observation that politicians, policymakers, need to be mindful that people care and it could have a bearing on what they're able to do moving forward. Okay, let's move forward to your other work. And I want to spend some time on this notion of our star, which is this idea of a real interest rate that kind of brings, it's where desired uh, investment, desired savings comes together. That's one way to look at it, or it could be viewed as the rate where you have price stability and we have a number of, of measures of that already. We have a famous Lobuck Williams or the Holstrom Lobuck Williams measure from the New York Fed. And theirs is constructed using kind of structural time series data. There's some other ones that have come out. Richmond Fed has a few. You could look at market estimates, look at five year, five year forward. But you have come out with a novel measure, you and your co authors. And it's from a paper titled Measuring the Natural Rate Using Natural Experiments. So walk us through this paper and what you found. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So this is a paper with Artef Mian, who's a professor at Princeton, and then Veronica Barker-Perel, who's a, a young researcher at Princeton, pre-PhD, but has been just absolutely magnificent to work with on this project. Okay, so maybe let me just set the scene. So why do we care about this thing called R star? I mean, most of your readers are probably familiar with it, but just to, to be clear, you know, we think there's this idea which I think goes back to Vexel, which is what he called the natural rate of interest. And this is what clears the market for saving and investment while ensuring stable inflation and full unemployment. So it's the interest rate at which the economy is at a steady equilibrium. And it's very interesting because it sort of movements in this natural rate are key for detecting structural shifts in the economy, such as whether or not the secular stagnation era has ended. So one example that's always the top of my mind is to think, okay, right now, interest rates are relatively high, asset prices are relatively low. But five years ago, during secular stagnation, the opposite was true. Asset prices were high, interest rates were low. Now, do we think that we're going to return to this world of low interest rates and high asset prices in the next few years? Or are we now in a permanent world of, of high interest rates and low asset prices? Very difficult to know. It's sort of, I think, the key macro question for market participants. How would we know the answer? Well, suppose that we could observe this kind of phantasm object R star, then we'd know what interest rate was naturally being gravitated towards. And then we could kind of figure out where, whether or not the economy is heading back to a low interest rate world or not. Crucial for central bankers, crucial for market participants, and so on. Of course, it's very difficult to measure. It's a long-run equilibrium of the economy once all the transitory factors have subsided. And so these influential, impressive papers by, for instance, Laubacher Williams, what they're trying to do is they're trying to use clever econometric techniques to infer R star, the long-run interest rate. Um, and, and of course, it's very difficult because to use these structural techniques, one has to be sure that the structure of the economy is correctly specified. And we macroeconomists know that we rarely understand the structure of the economy correctly. And so it's quite difficult to know what R star is. 
In practice, this is going to lead to real issues. So I think I actually saw this tweet from you, David. Different measures of R star disagree now, or at least when you tweeted by something like two or 300 basis points, like a really big amount. Some measures of R star say we're in the low interest rate world. Some say we're in the high interest rate world. So sort of there's a theoretical allure to R star. But in practice, when we try to measure it, really difficult to do so. So that one challenge is just the point estimates disagree a lot between these different structural models. A second one would be sort of nerdier, but I think equally important, which is that the standard errors associated with these estimates are giant. So the last time I checked the Laubach and Williams measure, it spans something like the 95% confidence interval span something like five or six percentage points of interest rates, really big amounts. Now, again, I, I don't mean to be mean-spirited. I think it's a crucial object to measure. And these people like Laubach and Williams and successors like Lubick and Mattes were, you know, really breaking the frontier. But we, what we wanted to do is see if we can come up with different different measures to come out there. So that's the preamble, so why we should care about our style. We're going to take a different approach. We're going to try and measure the natural rate of return using natural experiments and microdata. And we like this because it seems to be less sensitive to the specification issues. It seems to be more precise. But on the flip side, we're going to be measuring sort of a different object, an object that's specific to UK housing. In particular, we're going to be measuring the rate of return on UK housing in the long run. The object that we were talking about before that you mentioned, our star is something like the rate of return on government bonds in the United States in the long run. We're measuring the rate of return on housing in the UK in the long run. These two things might not be exactly the same. Why might they not be the same? Because, of course, a government bonds is like a risk-free asset, whereas UK housing might have risks associated with it. So we're measuring a different object, but we're going to have a really neat way to measure it. We're going to learn a lot of stuff, and hopefully that's going to, going to shed some light on these questions. So in particular, we're going to make use of this very strange feature of UK property, which is kind of intriguing. It would be surprising to US listeners, so I'll explain it briefly. Most apartments in the UK are sold as what's known as leaseholds. What are leaseholds? Leaseholds are long leases. So when I was a graduate student, I rented once per year. What is a leasehold? Instead of renting once per year, you rent for something like 100 years or 200 years. And these leaseholds are freely tradable. Moreover, leaseholders have the right to extend their lease, conditional on paying freeholders the value of a lease extension. And we can observe the value of these lease extensions. So essentially, we can observe what is the price of extending the lease of a property from something like a 90-year lease to an 180-year lease. The price of that extension basically says how much do markets value property in the very, very far future. In other words, what is the long-run rate of return on property? So that's the basic idea. We're going to use the fact that we can observe extensions for UK property to say what's the very long run value of UK property. Related to this R star thing, with R star, we're interested in the very long run value of government bonds. Here, we're going to measure the very long run value of UK property instead. So because we have all of this microdata, it turns out to be relatively tractable. We have something like 130,000 different lease extensions. It turns out that we can measure the long run value of UK property very precisely. We can measure it at a point in time. We can measure it every quarter. And we can measure it without making many structural assumptions about the economy. So previously, I talked about R star when I was trying to make lots of assumptions about the economy in order to measure R star. Here, we basically observe without making many assumptions what the value of property is in the long run. So that's the key idea, using this peculiar feature of UK assets, UK housing, to measure the very long run value of property, which is sort of a cousin. It's something somewhat adjacent to R star, but it's a long run discount rate in housing instead of government bonds. And what did you find? What's the trajectory of this real return? So it's sort of remarkable. We find that the long run rate of return on housing is about five percentage points in 2003, and it falls to about two percentage points by the end of 2023. So from five to two, these might not seem like big numbers, but these are actually very large numbers. So it's sort of the equivalent to a doubling of the price rent ratio. So it's quite similar to the amount by which R star seems to fall in. But it's also kind of, we think, kind of remarkable that the long run value of properties has basically doubled in the UK from 2003 to 2023. 
And so that's the first finding, like a big fall in the long run rate of return of property, sort of quite similar to the magnitudes by which R star has fallen. The second finding, which we think is sort of particularly relevant to the current debates, is that the long run rate of return on housing hasn't really risen since the start of 2023. It's risen, but by a very small amount. Now, what does that tell us? It kind of comes back to the motivation that I told you at the start, which is that exactly as you tweeted, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of debate right now about whether or not interest rates are going to return to their previous low level, or we're going to be in a higher world. Now, we have very long run valuations without having to make many assumptions. And our very long run valuations say tentatively that valuations are, are going to remain high, that interest rates and rates of return are going to remain low in the future. So that seems like a useful thing for policymakers. You know, we hope, we expect that policymakers will carry on measuring R star the ways they do. But if everything works out and goes to pan with this paper, the R measure might also enter the pantheon of indicators that, that policymakers will measure because it has these advantages of microdata, of precision, of making relatively few assumptions. And you have a website online that updates and provides kind of real time estimates of it, correct? That's very kind. So, uh, and, and with, with replication packet. So our hope is that, you know, for people who are interested, for people who want to use this in their own work, they can download the measure, they can replicate it themselves, they can extend it. All of the data is publicly available. And the website is on my webpage, on Arthur's webpage, on Veronica's webpage. We'll provide a link in the show notes as well. The only unfortunate thing about it is we don't have one for the U.S., right? <laughs> we, oh, we well, need... exactly, because the U.S. does not have this peculiar. Yes, issue. yes. So it would be great to have this kind of real return right. on capital, another way to kind of gauge uh, where the trend is going. But I guess in, in general then, you know, this suggests that rates will stay low for some time going forward. And that's consistent with my priors. Again, I'm, I'm speculating here, but I, I suspect the same things that kept rates low before the pandemic are with this are more pronounced demographics, risk aversion, regulations, all, all a number of things that uh, would suggest continued low rates once we can get to the final end of the, the pandemic bump. Yeah, I, I think that's right. So, I, I mean, exactly. So my prior is the same as yours, that we have all of these slow-moving structural factors that made rates low before and that haven't changed. And the, the ones that I would list, the global savings gap. So another famous paper by Ben Bernanke, that around the world, many countries, in particular China, were saving a lot and still are. A second factor would be demographics. That's only likely to get more extreme. A third factor would be the growth slowdown. That doesn't seem to have fully reversed around the world. So to take the other side of it, to hedge, to be a two-handed economist, if I thought, okay, why would it be the case if that interest rates would return to permanently higher levels? I think the main reason for that would be a big acceleration in growth rates. Where could that come from? Well, in the short run, the US does seem to be growing quite rapidly, much more rapidly than pre-COVID. Uh, you already know my views on that. I think that's probably something to do with fiscal stimulus. In the long run, fiscal stimulus will very likely peter out, of course. What could cause much higher growth rates in the long run? I'm quite bullish about AI. So here I've been reading a lot of, of, of blog posts by your colleague, Tyler, amongst others. I'm pretty bullish about AI. Uh, could AI increase GDP growth rates by a couple of percentage points per year? Maybe. It seems conceivable. Hard to know for sure. That's the kind of thing that I think would lead to a durable rise in interest rates. Uh, if I were a, a financial market participant, and I was allocating my bets. I would be allocating towards falling interest rates, but I'd have some hedge against a big spike, and I'd be monitoring the deployment of AI closely to see how quickly that's changing. Well, I hope that does happen. I hope we do have higher Absolutely. rates as a result of increased productivity growth from sure. AI and other inventions yeah. moving forward. That'd be awesome. Fantastic. All right, one other topic I want to touch on with you in the time we have left and this relates to work you've done on downward wage rigidity, kind of a, a key tenet of, of modern macroeconomics. I mean, there's also people, some people focus on output price rigidity. Some focus on financial contracts as, as a sticky price as well. But you know, downward wage rigidity is kind of key. It goes back to Keynes. And, and you have a really fascinating paper titled Wage Rigidity for New Hires. And walk us through this briefly, but I'll just tell you up front, it was fascinating to see that you can still have wage rigidity for employment relationships that haven't even formed yet or are going to form. So very, very powerful insight and suggests there really is something there to wage rigidity downwardly. I think so. So, OK, so let, let me back up. The bit that I find exciting is almost just for a second recapping the classic point. So the classic point, I believe, belongs to Keynes, but it may be earlier. You might know more history of economic thought than I do. Why does unemployment rise during recessions? Because of downward wage rigidity, just like you were saying. Wages don't fall during recessions. 
So unemployment rises because the cost of labor remains high, even as labor demand falls. Firms stop hiring, they start firing workers. So that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, you go to the data, wages rarely fall. So, and I'll sort of weave in some economic history. Up until the 2000s, I think this was basically viewed as a settled question. Most of the ways you looked at it, nominal wages didn't fall very much. So downward wage utility seemed to be a very a satisfactory explanation of why unemployment rose during recessions. At some point in the 2000s, I think things were sort of turned on their heads for very smart reasons by my colleague, Chris Bissarides. And so he pointed out that actually maybe a particularly important kind of wage is the wage for a newly hired worker. Why is that the case? Because when I'm a firm, if I'm deciding whether or not to hire a worker, what matters is not my incumbent workers who I've already hired, but the wage for a newly hired worker. Now, if that wage were flexible, if that wage fell a lot during recessions, then I might c- carry on hiring lots of workers even during recessions. If I'm hiring lots of workers even during recessions, that's really going to stabilize the rise in unemployment. You know, unemployment threatens to rise. Newly hired workers say, look, I'm really happy to take a very low wage. Then unemployment doesn't rise because all of these workers are hired out of unemployment. So Pissarides said, look, maybe what really matters is the wage for new hires. Moreover, and this is the second point, by introspection, as Reedy said, it seems really quite likely that wages for newly hired workers are in fact quite flexible. Most of the intuitions that we have for why wages should be downwardly rigid apply to continuing workers. As a continuing worker, I'd be as angry as hell if LSE cut my wage in nominal terms. But if I were a newly hired worker, LSE just offers me a contract. You know, I'm just happy to, to get off the, the job market and, and become employed. I have no reference point. What does it even mean for the wage to be downwardly rigid? And so by introspection, Pissarini said, look, probably wages for newly hard workers are in fact quite flexible. This is what matters. And so, in fact, the downward wage the hypothesis isn't as compelling as we thought. And so I think this was one of the truly interesting insights that came out of the 2000s about theory and empirics. So the final thing is Pissarini went one step further and he surveyed work on the flexibility of the wage for new hires. And he found that when one looked at the data, Average wages for new hires seem to be quite flexible. What do I mean by an average wage? Take the wage of all new hardly hired workers hired at a point in time, compare it in booms versus busts. The average wage for new hires seems to be a lot higher during booms than busts. So I think, you know, this really overturned the apple cart. It's an amazing paper. It's an econometric in 2009. So what to make of it? How, how do we think about downward wage agility afterwards? Is there downward wage agility? Well, it turns out that there's a sort of empirical challenge to what Pissarides was doing, and that's to do with job composition. So let, let me tell you in slightly more concretely what Pissarides finds and then why it's a bit more complicated. So imagine there's an economy of high-wage bankers and low-wage baristas. Imagine during booms, mostly the economy is hiring bankers. And during busts, mostly the economy is hiring baristas. Then during booms, the average wage for new hires is going to be pretty high. It's mostly bankers. During busts, the average wage for new hires is going to be pretty low. It's going to be mostly baristas. So the average wage for new hires looks pretty flexible, even if wages vary very little for bankers and baristas. So even if wages are rigid for bankers and rigid for baristas, so the wage for new hires is in fact rigid, this old Keynesian thing, the data that Pissarides was looking at that's averaging across different kinds of jobs, averaging across bankers and baristas, could in fact look quite flexible. So the real difficulty then, I think, coming out of the debate was that we didn't really have ways that we could control for the composition of who was being hired. The ideal here in this example I've given you is you want to see looking only at banker jobs, how does the banker wage vary for new hires? Looking only at barista jobs, how does the barista wage vary for new hires? One doesn't want to pull between them because then the shifting composition between bankers and baristas can, can mess things up. So that was the starting observation for my paper, which is that what one really wants is one wants a measure of wage rigidity for new hires that can correct for job composition. So what we did, me and my co-author, Bloody Tasker. So Bloody Tasker worked then at a company called Burning Glass Technologies, which scrapes online vacancies in the inter- on the internet. So most hiring now in the United States is done online and has been since about 20, 2012 or so. A subset, not a large subset. So, you know, it's an important caveat to the paper. A subset like 5% of vacancies post wages. But what is very useful is that these vacancies not only post wages, but have very detailed descriptions of the kinds of jobs that these vacancies are doing. In particular, you can see the firm, you can see the job, 
you can see the occupation and so on. So imagine a physical location of Starbucks in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that regularly posts vacancies for baristas and pays them an hourly wage. We can track all that information. We can see the hourly wage for baristas across multiple vacancies posted by the Starbucks. We can see sort of how the wage changes for this specific job. That means that we can purge for job composition. We can just look for every job in the economy, every job in our data, do wages rise, do wages fall for new hires across successive new vacancies. So that was why we like the data, because one can look at job level wage changes for new hires, for new vacancy postings without this challenge of composition. And so in the end, the finding is very simple, which is that sort of surprisingly, wages for new hires are in fact quite downwardly rigid, though flexible upwards. So across successive barista vacancies in that Starbucks in Cambridge, the wage will almost never fall. It will rise sometimes, but it will almost never fall. During expansions, when unemployment falls by a lot, the wage will rise by a lot. But during contractions, when unemployment rises, the wage won't fall by very much. Just as Keynes originally conceived, but now we have it for a measure of the new higher wage for the wage posted on vacancies. So that is a really fascinating finding, counterintuitive. My, my colleague and boss, Tyler Cowan, thinks this is probably one of the most important findings in recent years uh, in terms of this debate about sticky downward wages. So what's the story behind that? Why would it be the case that new higher wages are down really rigid? Because again, you might think intuitively, like you just said, like you, you being hired at LSE, you'd have no reference point, right? So, so what do you think is happening in the background that explains this? Absolutely. And I should say, Tyler, when I was a job student, Tyler was very kind. He blogged about my paper. You know, I've always been a huge fan of Mercatus and Marginal Revolution, but it was so for that reason, it was a very proud moment for me. Here's what I think is likely the story. And then I will maybe say a bit of evidence about it from another paper I have. I think probably it's to do with internal equity, as originally conceived of in this very famous book by this Yale professor, Truman Bewley, which is called Why Don't Wages Fall During Recessions? It's an amazing book. And Bewley imagines the following that I think probably applies to my analysis. He says, look, the first logic, the, the simple logic that you might have is that wages for new hires would fall during recessions, exactly because of the LSE professor example. You know, I become a new professor. I'm willing to accept a lower wage because I, I have no reference point. But then Bewley says, not so fast. What about this idea that he calls internal equity? And internal equity works like the following. I arrive at LSE. When I go around the hallways and I say, you know, I just got hired. Great job. You know, I'm on 10 bucks an hour. And then my colleague, who's the same rank as me, you know, he's not he's not a, a tenured chaired professor. He's just another assistant professor who got hired just the year before. He says, well, you're only being paid 10 bucks now. I'm being paid 20 bucks now. They screwed you. I, I'd be furious immediately. You know, I'd be marching into the chair's office. I'd say, what do you mean? We're doing the same job. He's being paid so much more than I am. And so that's the internal equity idea of Bewley, which says that there might be various reasons why firms are sort of constrained to pay the same wage for new hires and continuing workers. One reason might be the sort of fairness story that I just told, which is that it's very difficult to pay otherwise similar workers different wages because the worker who's paid worse might sort of revolt, essentially. And one can imagine other stories too. So for instance, there might be managerial frictions. Imagine now we're not LSC, but we're part of some big bureaucracy, you know, a very large multinational company or, or whatever. They might just have a pay scale. They might just pay all janitors or managers of a certain rank the same wage. It might just not be worth their while to differentiate between different managers. So I think something like that's probably going on. I have a paper called National Wage Testing. That's with Heather Sarsons, also with Letty Tasker again with Christina Patson. So Heather and Christina are uh, fantastic assistant professors at, at Chicago Booth. And both of them with me, what we found was that firms using the same data, firms tend to pay very similar wages for the same job, even in different geographic regions. So for instance, Starbucks for baristas tends to pay the same wage in Cambridge as it does in New York, as it does in San Francisco. And so that's quite, quite consistent with firms having a sort of relatively limited ability to differentiate wages between observably different workers of the same position. And that would be sort of consistent with this internal equity story that Beauty was telling. So interesting. I could continue on this conversation for some time, but we are now at the end of the program. I want to thank you, Jonathan, for coming on the show. Our guest today has been Jonathan Hazel. Jonathan, thank you again for coming on the program. David, thank you. It's been great to listen to the podcast episodes, to, to read your blog over the years. So I'm looking forward to learning even more from you in the future. Thanks a lot. 
Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings.